Okay, uh, what is your name, please? Sonia Firstenau. And you are the? I'm the MLA for the amazing traditional territory and unceded territory of Cowichan tribes and Malahat, and known as the Cowichan Valley. And I'm also the leader of the BC Green Party. Um, so how would you describe the situation at Ferry Creek? <sighs> hmm. What's, it, what's interesting about Ferry Creek is that what's happening there has been happening in British Columbia for decades. And what people are waking up to is that we're down to these very last intact pieces of old growth watersheds, old growth forests in British Columbia. And Ferry Creek is one of the last ones. But for decades, Government after government has allowed industry to take down these ancient forests and these ancient trees. And for the most part, not a lot of people have paid attention. Um, let's talk about the election and then we'll go back to Ferry Creek. But um, can you, for people who aren't in British Columbia or wouldn't necessarily know, um, when did John, John Horgan call an election and what was that process like? So he called an election on September 21st. Um, up until that day, uh, there had been a minority government in British Columbia, and the, the government was an NDP government led by John Horgan, and the balance of power was uh, the BC Green Party. I had won the leadership race on September 14th, exactly one week before that election was called. And I met with him on September 18th, and we made this very public. We presented him with a letter and a plan for what could be done in the, the last year of the mandate of this minority government. And he obviously had his political motivation. And I think this is really important to recognize under a first-past-the-post system, it was a perfect political reason to call an election. They were ahead in the polls. Uh, governments tend to do well in crises that they appear to be managing effectively. And they took advantage of the fact that they had a, a bump in the polls and they wanted a majority and they did what two other minority governments in Canada did and which we probably are going to see the federal government do shortly, which is seize power. And one of his election promises, uh, many of his election promises, but specifically he promised uh, old growth forest protection. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, there's a bit of a backstory here. So um, from 2017, uh, when that minority government came into being and we'd signed the agreement, in that agreement was some uh, language around forestry, uh, modernizing forestry. Um, and from the very beginning, Adam Olson, MLA for Saanich, and I uh, had been coming back to the issue of old growth forests over and over again in question period, in estimates, raising it. In 2019, we called for a moratorium on all of the you know, high risk valley bottoms of old growth on Vancouver Island uh, not to be logged. And, uh, and what the NDP did, which is what's very typical of them, is they, they you know, commissioned a, a review. And they got two foresters and um, they produced what's well known as the Old Growth Strategic Review. And they were the panel. And that review has 14 recommendations. When the review was first released, the NDP and John Horgan said that they would agree to implement some of the recommendations. During the election campaign, and particularly on the debate night, I actually put it to him, will you implement all of the recommendations? And he skated around it that night, but came out the next day and said, yes, we will implement all of the recommendations of the Strategic Old Growth Review Panel. And People believed him because this is an issue that really matters to a lot of British Columbians, as you know. And then the election came and went and they got their majority. And the most important kind of starting point of those recommendations is two things. One is work with First Nations, Indigenous communities. And two is put an immediate deferral on all of the at-risk old growth forests. 
that's recommendation one and six. And what they, the government has done is said, oh no, we're, we're implementing recommendation one, we're talking to First Nations, we can't make any decisions until we've done all that consultation. But they're ignoring that recommendation six doesn't mean you do it sixth place, you do it concurrently because, as we've pointed out over and over again, you can't preserve a tree after it's been cut down. You can't have conversations about protecting old growth while the old growth is being cut down because it's gone forever. And what we've seen since the election and, and over the past many months is a lot of language and you know, we're, we are going to implement these recommendations and we are doing our consultations and yet on the ground they have issued a significant number of new permits for logging old growth. They are ignoring First Nations who have been loudly calling for deferrals on their territories and they are really allowing business as usual to go and uh, for these trees and forests to come down. I'm going to talk about injunctions generally first and the way that um, industry uses courts to get injunctions to protect their interests but governments often leave the public interest for the public to defend and the public can feel very alone in that situation and, and Ferry Creek is a, an example of this. The government has a duty and a responsibility in this and they are ignoring that and they are shielding their, their abandonment of this issue by having the, the company go get the injunction. The government issued the permits. The government can put deferrals on those permits. The government can revoke those permits. And so they actually have the power to solve this and they are sitting back and not using that power. This is very similar. We had the, a big watershed fight here in Seanigan and the company got an injunction against the protesters. And so we were, as a community, trying to defend our drinking watershed from a five million ton contaminated soil landfill at the top of the drinking watershed. And people were standing up every morning in front of trucks that were bringing in soil full of contaminated, or bringing in, yeah, trucks full of contaminated soil. And the company went and got an injunction against the protesters. And ultimately people got arrested in Shawnigan and uh, it was a, there have been many, many uh, kind of costs to people in this community. The permit was eventually revoked because it sh never should have been issued in the first place. But the government was a very passive player in all that. They only revoked that permit after the community had literally given everything they had. Uh, court challenges, protests, media, relentless work that we all did. And, and this is similar. It's, it's not okay for the provincial government, it's not okay for John Horgan and Katrine Conroy to sit back while this conflict is unfolding when they have the tools, the capacity and the power to solve it. And they're not doing that. It's an interesting contrast because here in Shawnigan, the, the environment minister was Mary Polak at the time, yeah. BC Liberals. And we engaged in social media a lot. And periodically, she would respond to people in the community. She would put in a response on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, and the way we approached it was, here's the person with the power to solve the situation. And so we consistently reminded her you have the power to fix this. Here's how. Here, here's how we're, we're giving you everything you need. And every time she did something that we appreciated, like sent an inspection or put a stop work on or whatever, we would praise her publicly. Thank you. This is, thank you, Minister, for doing this. Here's the next thing you need to do. And then ultimately, she did. She revoked the permit, right? It's very interesting contrast to what's happening with the NDP in that they won't talk about it, they won't engage, they won't acknowledge their responsibility and the burden that they have in this, in creating this situation and also refusing to solve it. And the, the kind of message box communications is actually, in my opinion, inflaming 
the situation. People know when they're not being told the truth. People know when somebody's giving them, you know, a comms message box. And when you're talking about something that we feel as deeply as we do, we're talking about the oldest living creatures on the planet, perhaps? I mean, I guess there's some marine life that might be older than this, but in terms of living beings, living things that we can interact with, a thousand-year-old tree is unlike anything else. And to respond in a kind of, you know, government-crafted message to people imploring for the protection of some of the last of these trees is a complete lack of understanding of the situation we're in and the responsibility we have as humans in this moment what we're in because what we decide today impacts all of the future and i i'm so disappointed in how they are responding to this let's talk about indigenous reconciliation mm -hmm. for a minute uh, it's very complicated mm -hmm. there are uh, band councils, there are hereditary mm -hmm. chiefs, there are a lot of mixed feelings and emotions on the ground from the mm -hmm. indigenous communities themselves. There are multiple nations, the Pachidat, mm -hmm. the Dididat, the Hayuat. So uh, if you could just sort of speak broadly in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the situation, in terms of the indigenous communities, and then we'll relate it to John Horgan. I'm, I'm sure Adam had incredible things to say on this, and yeah. Adam is the embodiment of why we need Indigenous representation in our legislatures, in Parliament, in government, because representation really matters. And Adam is able to represent uh, a perspective that, of course, I can't. Uh, anybody who's not Indigenous cannot represent that. And, and he's a, a force of education. I mean, he, he's an ask me anything guy, right? And he's so uh, honest and upfront and wonderful. And he's lived this. He's lived on a reservation his whole life. His dad went to the Supreme Court to fight for his right to hunt and fish. This is, this is Adam at a cellular level is engaged on this. What I think is so important is this issue, logging old growth, how we manage forest, is so deeply embedded with colonialism because colonialism is all about getting access to the resources and the wealth of the land. And that land was inhabited by indigenous peoples long before any Europeans got here. And the entire kind of unra unrolling of history since white colonial settlers came here has been about who gets to have this wealth and the resource benefits agreements that are still being signed between governments and First Nations are very much aligned with this whole colonial history of this is how we settle who gets the wealth and in those agreements it's very clear this is about securing the interests of crown land and it's ensuring that industry gets its share of the wealth, the province gets its share of the wealth, and the First Nations gets a share of the wealth, not its share. Yeah, very minimal. We'll come back to finances in a minute. But when John Horgan says uh, Indigenous reconciliation, what does that mean to you? Is it genuine? Is it a talking point? Hmm. I was at a meeting uh, of health professionals here in Cowichan, uh, and it was about um, delivery of health at the hospital. And as we know from Mary Ellen Trapel report last year, Indigenous people experience systemic racism when they interact with our healthcare system. This meeting was two years before that report came out. Uh, and there was a, a Cowichan member, and the conversation was, how do we create cultural safety in our 
in our healthcare system here in Cowichan as a part of reconciliation. And he said, before reconciliation, truth. And that really stuck with me. Like, we often just seem to want to leap to the reconciliation part. Okay, how do, we, how do we fix this? And I think right now, as a country, we are in the midst of like, oh, we have nowhere, we have come nowhere near reckoning with the truth. And as uh, the residential schools and the unmarked graves and the bodies of children uh, come, become uncovered, not just physically, but in our consciousness as who we are as a nation. When I hear John Horgan talk about indigenous reconciliation, but not about truth, and not about the fact that his government continues to operate very much along the same colonial lines as governments have operated here forever, and not about the, the fact that when a nation is given one choice, that's not a choice, right? And the choice is, you know, with these benefit agreements, this activity is going to happen. Your choice is you sign on and agree to it and see some benefit from it, or you don't, and it still happens. This is not reconciliation. This is so far from reconciliation. And it's divorced from the truth. It's divorced from the reality that these lands should never have been controlled and given to benefit and to create wealth in the ways that they have been and decimated in the ways that they have been. And now here we are, and we're, we're in that scarcity moment. We're down to the last bits. And so the stakes are incredibly high. And a, when you're shielding your actions behind these kinds of words, it renders those words and the intentions behind them meaningless. Let's talk a little bit about the protesters that are on the territory now. There have been over 300 arrests mm -hmm. as of today. Uh, can you just sort of speak to your thoughts about the arrestee process? I, I'm concerned on a number of fronts. I'm concerned about this, this exclusion zone and how suddenly, um, you know, we're seeing these kinds of actions and behaviors from the RCMP. Witsowetan had a, a similar uh, kind of approach where the media and observers were, were kept away, where the interpretation of the injunction is being, uh, I would say, stretched quite widely. Um, by the police and how they're operating. And the, the kind of foundations of civil society and within that, civil disobedience, which is something that in Canada has resulted in some of the most important progressions we've seen as a society. Uh, that we have entered, it seems, a, a new phase where the, the RCMP acting on behalf of industry that got this injunction through the courts is applying to their actions a, a level of force and a level of control um, over people who, are, who should not be experiencing that, the press, legal observers, observers, uh, it, it, that is very worrying to me. I think a lot about um, our institutions, about democracy, and about the way that the corrosive and eroding aspects like this um, are very distressing and very worrying on a, on a bigger scale. And we need transparency and accountability and oversight, and the public needs to be able to, to see what's happening and to have that restricted and to have, as far as I can tell, nobody in government 
drawing a line and saying, wait, we're still a democracy. These basic civil liberties exist. Civil disobedience is uh, absolutely allowed. And yes, you can enforce this injunction, but not, not to this extent. And I know that there's a, a legal action has been filed as of yesterday, I understand, by the protesters on this. And the journalists have filed a legal action as well. But this is, this is, you know, we shouldn't be having to weaponize courts to uphold what we have agreed on, our, our kind of rights and responsibilities in Canada. And that's the rights and responsibilities of citizens as well as law enforcement, institutions, governments, right? We, we have these social contracts. And I worry a lot when I see that those contracts not being upheld and the implications for all of us are very worrying on that front. Moving to the police, mm -hmm. we have been on the front lines. Yeah. We have been excluded as media from, from viewing a lot of things, but there are uh, a lot of stories of police brutality, of police mm -hmm. overstretching, mm -hmm. and that the police may be acting as a private militia for a corporation. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I'm really worried about those. what I'm hearing as well and some of the images that are coming out. Um, and exactly this. What is the role of publicly funded police in a situation like this? And again, the oversight on who's interpreting how this injunction is being uh, used uh, by the by the police in this case and why are they being allowed to do this I think these are really really important questions and and I'm I'm really concerned I really am and I think that that you know there's there's all sorts of ramifications here um, around the funding for this operation um, and, and then the, the transparency and accountability. Uh, and these are questions that Adam and I are, are pursuing. We are worried. Let's talk about the loggers a little bit. Um, one of the sort of strongest mainstream talking points is jobs, logger jobs. We have to cut down these trees because it's our jobs. Um, how would you respond to, to the livelihoods of loggers and mm -hmm. what alternatives might exist? If our forest industry was really oriented towards the livelihood of loggers, we wouldn't see the data that we see over the last decade or so, particularly on Vancouver Island, where the annual allowable cut has gone up and the number of jobs has gone down. And so industry has become more and more mechanized. It takes fewer and fewer people to remove those trees. Um, with the end of appurtenancy, there was no link between harvesting and jobs in mills in communities and so that that capacity for forestry to truly be a, a community supporting industry really got severed uh, we know that we you know not all logs but a lot of logs are being shipped out of british columbia and off of this island raw you just have to go to the terminal in nanaimo to see that uh, so if this was really about jobs then government would be much more assertive and much more aggressive about the resource that belongs to everybody and how that resource is being used. We could be cutting down a lot fewer trees and have a lot more jobs if there was a, a requirements by industry as put in place by government. This is a, this is a public resource and here's how you're allowed to use it. Um, but in fact, what we've had decade over decade is a lessening of that. And what this really is about is extracting profit. And if the industry was concerned about jobs, that you just need to look at, at the reality and the data here. We are talking five to 10 years of cutting old growth and there's no more jobs in cutting old growth because it's gone. That's not a sustainable employment plan, right? Uh, and I think that we have to recognize that when we're 
when we're looking at, at the land base and, and in a climate emergency, we're standing here at the tail end of what has been a brutalizing heat wave. Uh, forests play several roles. And when a forest is cut down the way that we allow them to be cut down, clear cut, they stop playing every single role that they can play. Every single one, they're done. So if this was really about jobs, we wouldn't be clear cutting. We'd be doing selective logging. That's gonna be a lot more jobs. We would make sure that every piece of wood is processed and manufactured and value added. If this was about jobs, uh, there are many, many ways that we can achieve far more jobs with far fewer trees than we are doing right now. This is about profit. Very well said. Uh, and also, there are companies who do ecotourism in the area, and Paul Manley made this sort of apparent to us, but um, that ecotourist companies have been kept out of these exclusion zones as well. So there's right. almost um, a preference given to certain industry over other industries. Right. Do you have any thoughts on a sort of industry piece? Yeah, uh, again, it, it's the notion that, you know, there's, there needs to be economic development, absolutely, in these communities and for First Nations. But when there's only one avenue to achieve that, that's not choice. That's not, and, and we look at the Great Bear Rainforest as an, as an example of where, uh, you know, the work was done to look at how do we create a long-term sustainable future for the forest, the communities, for ecotourism, that doesn't just involve, we take it out, and then we're done here, right? And the, the notion that we're in 2021 in a biodiversity collapse, in a global warming emergency, and we are still taking out forests as though they're just going to magically reappear is astonishing to me. I, um, I was building boardwalks in the Walbrun in 1991 as part of the efforts to protect that forest when I was 21 years old. And, and then we had Clackwit Sound on the heels of that. And I think a lot of us thought that, that those efforts, uh, the war in the woods then, would actually result not just in the protection of Clackwit Sound, but in the transformation of the forest range to say, it didn't. And when you fly over, I was on the finance committee a couple of years ago, and so we all these little planes flying all over British Columbia to communities, and it's not a patchwork of, of forests anymore. It, like it is just these massive clear cuts with little trails of forest between them. Like they're not forests anymore; they're just lines of trees that are left. And you, you can't look at that and think well, this is going to serve the future well, right? It is, a, I'm, I'm listening to Braiding Sweetgrass right now, Robin Kemmerer. It's a beautiful book. I listen to it while I garden and have it in my ear. And she talks about reciprocity, that you don't take more than you give. And we are so far away from reciprocity in, in how we've managed forests in British Columbia for so long. It has been all about taking yeah that's very there's a couple more you've been talking for a while and it's amazing and but uh there is this uh we'll call it a deferral a two-year deferral yeah. that has been announced uh through the three nations and john horgan has now sort of used this as a talking point of the importance of this deferral uh yet at the same time gikasan and other nations have also asked for deferrals squamish squamish uh why is this one all of a sudden important and the other one's not? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we've asked exactly that question. If you're going to respect the nation's wishes on deferrals here, uh, Squamish came out publicly uh, and said they want a deferral on all old growth in all of their territory immediately. And that's been silence in response to that. Uh, there have been nations on northern Vancouver Island who have been asking for deferrals for years and watched while the trees have come down and no response from government. Um, to me, 
I've been thinking about this a lot the last few days, especially about th this emergency that we're in and how w we are going to find ourselves in a kind of relentless, uh, you know, intersecting emergency. So we've just come through COVID, you know, this global health emergency. Uh, and now we're in a uh, heat wave emergency. I just saw the news that 50 people died in Vancouver yesterday from the heat. The forest fires have started. We're going to go into a forest fire emergency. Uh, that will result in erosion of lands and we're going to see flooding and we're going to see droughts. Those will be emergencies. We are, we are sort of stumbling along into the next emergency. And, and this is not, should not be surprising. This is what scientists have been telling us is, is the outcome of our neglect to get in front of, you know, the, the ecological uh, and climate crises. I do want to just uh, touch upon the patchwork that's been going on in terms of forestry policy. So yeah. we've already sort of hit on Walbrand and Carmana Valley, and now we're talking about Ferry Creek. Is yeah. it going to continue to be a piecemeal of these different yeah. areas, or is it possible to actually have comprehensive forest policy in this province? What we need is, is pretty significant systemic change. And so for, for land management, uh, we need to move into co-governance models. And we have an example here with Couch and Watershed Board, co-chaired by Chief of Couch and Tribes and the chair of the CBRD. And, and that needs to be extended. And, and we need to move away from, the, as you say, this patchwork of forestry policy and, and approaches, which has been timber value based. That's the fundamental thing here. Uh, into looking at our regions, our watersheds, and saying, how do we ensure that we have health and, and well-being on the land and for the species and for the people? I mean, this is, these are the questions we need to be asking right now. And we need to look at um, Indigenous protected conservation areas as a model for how we recover from the damage that's been done. And there's some amazing work. If you haven't talked to Eli Enns yet, you should. I have not, and I'll ask you for his phone number. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we, 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 ha we cannot keep doing the same thing and think that it's going to produce different outcomes. It, it won't. And so we, we actually need quite urgently to change how we are approaching this. And it, 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 it has to recognize that the land will ultimately treat us the way we treat it. And it's, it's not going to be good. You can look decade after decade. You can go back to like 50 years ago, and there are reports on forestry policy and management in BC that are the same as what are coming out now, identifying the same risks, the same problems, and the same solutions, and Government after government after government has been unwilling to bring in the changes that are necessary to truly own up to the burden of responsibility that they have to the future in managing uh, the lands here. And so we have to give up on that approach. The province is not going to do this. They never have. And we have to look at different models of land management governance, and it has to be co-governance, has to be Indigenous-led, and we have to get there very quickly. Let's talk money. This is a big one, and it's a long question, so I apologize. Um, but we now heard from the Rainley, according to their estimates, the one block of old forest is worth about $9 million. Of that, the province will receive about $2 million, and the territory of Indigenous for example, with the Pachi that will receive under 300,000. So the province gets about $2 million, let's say, on, on one yeah. block. Uh, then if you add in the costs of the protesters, yep. the police, police services, the courts. It's gonna cost more. It's gonna be more than $2 million for sure. And, and this is the part that I don't understand. Like I don't understand the logic here because right at the outset, the province has all the tools and all the power it needs to solve this right now. 
and they're not doing it. They're not using those tools and they're not using that power. And it's, it's a shameful level of irresponsibility that they're showing. It's shameful. And then just the, the piece about the nations themselves receiving literally pennies yeah. on the dollar. Yeah, and, and again, this is, you know, this is about extracting wealth and getting most of that wealth into the hands of shareholders and companies. Some of that wealth into the hands of the province, which is squandering it, and very little of it to the nations whose territories this is. And then when it's all said and done, what do you have left? And, and this is where conservation financing, the opposite approach to this, would be to say, you know, here's the wealth, here's the funding, so that we can conserve what's here and create economic opportunities. You know, imagine the, the capacity to say, come to Port Renfrew, you know, stay on Pachidat territory and be led by Pachidat people into one of the world's last intact ancient forests and come and understand it the way that we understand it, see it the way we see it. And I think I just, I, I can't imagine, I can't understand why we would let that go. And you consider the, the West Coast Trail, right? That is an international appeal. But it, it, why are we not saying, as the Chamber of Commerce in uh, Port Renfrew is already very clearly advocating for, this is enormous potential for long-term economic activity and development. And, but once it's gone, who's going to come see clear cuts? Last question on Costa, and I just want to ask one question about democracy, and then I will okay. stop. Okay, my favorite moment. topic. <laughs> yeah, uh, but what is the cost of inaction? I mean, we have now had this, last oh. year we had forest fires, this year we have a heat wave. Yeah. What is the cost of not doing something to our society? Oh. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't even, I, I think about my children, I think about children in general, I think about future generations, and I've said this uh, quite a bit. I, I want us to be making decisions that they don't have to forgive us for. But where we're at right now, uh, I don't know how they could forgive us collectively. There's... There's no way that anybody can plead ignorance right now about the implications of cutting down ancient forests, the implications of destroying ecological systems, of taking out habitat, of ruining biodiversity, some of the last extraordinary biodiversity that these forests hold. There's, you cannot say that you don't understand the implications of that, both here and globally. And this is a crime against the future. And we have to stop committing crimes against the future. And then this democracy, what is democracy? Uh, recently, Brian Adams, a very mm -hmm. well known Canadian singer, was on the CBC and he called for British Columbians to vote out John Horgan in four years. Mm -hmm. But is voting for a dictator every four years real democracy? And how, for people who feel betrayed, mm -hmm. what is any sort of course of, of action, reaction, of any sort of accountability with the powers that be? You know, on the weekend with the, the first blast of the heat wave, I, I put I make charts, that's how I try to understand and take out of my head what, what I'm thinking. And in the middle of the chart was climate emergency. And then all of these intersecting emergencies out of that. We have so many emergencies right now. So climate emergency, biodiversity collapse. We have a housing emergency. We have an inequality emergency. and uh, the other emergencies make that worse. So who dies from COVID? 
people who are already uh, at the wrong side of inequality. Who dies in a heat wave? People who can't afford to be in a house that has air conditioning. Uh, we have a, a toxic drug supply emergency. Um, we have, uh, you know, really a, a, a growing crisis in public education that will turn into an emergency if we continue to have a scarcity approach to public education. We have a racism and intolerance emergency, really, that is growing. We have the... Glad, I'm glad that we have this dawning realization of the emergency of, of, of indigenous peoples in this country. Um, but the emergency around really changing uh, the future of, of our country so that reconciliation is at the center of it has to be seen as such an urgent job. So, and then at the very top of this was failure of our governance systems and institutions. Our political system has encouraged and rewarded political parties uh, to make decisions that are not to the benefit of the public, but to the benefit of their parties. And more and more it feels like people get elected and then they represent their parties to the public, as opposed to representing the public inside the legislature or inside parliament. And we're, we're not equipped right now. Our current approach to politics and governance will fail because the, the practice of our governance is far too imbued with partisanship and, and political motivation. Unnecessarily holding elections during a pandemic because it benefits your party, to me, is the ultimate indication of how broken we've become in our politics. And so what we need is a recognition that these emergencies require of us a different approach to how we make decisions, to how we govern. And it's, it's going to be essential that First Nations and communities are informing provincial and federal governments of what's needed to achieve the outcomes that we all have to achieve. And those outcomes have to be about food security and water security, local energy security, local economy thriving, the well-being of children, the well-being of, of all of us, our mental health, our physical health. Our neighborhoods have to be healthy places where they are, where we are dismantling racism and intolerance because they are connected and vibrant and we know each other and we care for each other. And to achieve that, we need, we need far more of our decision making to be coming off the ground rather than being imposed onto the ground. And we have to get there really quickly. Oh, I, I mean, I, I feel more hopeful now about uh, the future of the tiny bit of old growth we have left because the attention has finally arrived, the attention that is needed. And uh, it is this kind of local, provincial, federal, national, global attention that is going to change the outcome of this story. That attention has to stay. That is the, that is the pressure that's needed. And I, I've been saying to everybody that I talk to about this, all of us have a role to play. Adam and I have been playing this role in the legislature for four years. We've been, we've been pushing on protecting old growth nonstop. Protesters have a role. The elders who come to the legislature every week, media, documentary makers, uh, innovators, artists, companies, uh, everybody has a role to play in this. And it's when all of that starts to happen simultaneously that that, that immense pressure pushes things to where they need to get to. And never forget, when you're, when you're trying to make change, 
It's not, no, maybe, soon, getting there, almost, yes. It's no, 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 yes. And so you never know if the last, if the no you're getting right now is the last one or the tenth to last one or the hundredth to last one, but you never stop. And persistence is a superpower. You have to persist. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. <laughs>